Worthington, what would you say to a person who says, I, I cannot, absolutely cannot forgive this other person who's wronged me? Yeah, I would say, uh, well, congratulations, you're human. Uh, because, you know, there are just things we, we all can't forgive. And, and there are many ways to deal with injustices in our life that are not forgiveness. You know, if I, if I see justice done, that reduces my sense of injustice. If I uh, turn matters over to God, I mean, you know, seeing justice done, God is for justice. And there's some more in the Bible about justice than there is about forgiveness. That is certainly right in line with God's heart is seeing justice done and turning the matter over to God, you know, for God's divine judgment. Uh, it not or just to relinquish it not my problem this is your problem god i i relinquish this to you or i could tolerate it which is not the best way to do it but sometimes is the only way we can can deal with a, a wrong or i can forbear forbearance is certainly scriptural uh you know paul said forgiving them and forbearing so forbearance is to forgive for the good of the relationship or the good of the group or, you know, or not forgive, but to, uh, to not respond negatively for the good of the group or the good of the relationship. I'm just going to forbear. I can accept and move on with life or I could forgive. So there, there are many biblically consistent ways to deal with uh uh injustices in our life and unforgiveness that don't involve forgiveness and so what people can do is they can use these ways you know whichever ones work for them to reduce the sense of injustice to get to the place where whatever in sense of unforgiveness they are holding they now can forgive because it's not such a big step as it was at the beginning. Dr. Worthington, what happens when we don't forgive? Well, uh, you know, from just a human standpoint, uh, we are going to experience a lot of consequences uh, for holding on to unforgiveness. So the consequences fall into the area, into the areas of the spiritual consequences, but also relational consequences, mental health consequences, and physical health consequences. So we've edited a book on just health and forgiveness. And so there's a whole book of like 30 essays summarizing the different health consequences of holding on to unforgiveness. And, uh, and they, they have to do with basically every system in your body being negatively affected. So, uh, and, and this is just from the experience of, you know, cortisol. Uh, so, you know, when we, when we experience stress, which is, you know, what, unforgiveness is is something stressful it's a stressful response to a, a transgression that's happened that we have praised as being dangerous to us and so we experience this stress and our body responds of course in a way that we have been designed to respond which is to uh <clears throat> get rid of all of the things we don't need and get away from the lion that's after us. You know, if I'm leaving the faculty club and a lion attacks me outside the faculty club, you know, I want to run away and my stress response will, will help me to get away. And, uh, but the problem is being a human, all these lions that we encounter are often our, 
our ruminations and our thoughts and our replaying of this mentally. And so we just get continually harassed by lions uh, of our own creation. And, uh, and so it keeps our stress response going in ways that it's not, it, we were not designed to, to keep going. And one of the things that it does is it, you know, stimulates our adrenal glands, which produce adrenaline, but also produce cortisol and other glucocorticoids, as they're called. And, and so a long-term abundance of these glucocorticoids in our body will shrink our brain uh, sometimes as much as 25%. And mostly it works on the hippocampus, which is what consolidates memories. So, so we often get foggy with our memories when we're just stressed and stressed and stressed and holding on to unforgiveness. Um, but it can also affect our prefrontal cortex, which you know, does the hard things when the hard things are the things we ought to do. So it's making self-controlled decisions. So, so we maybe don't make the best self-controlled decisions. We lose our temper more, we're irritable, we're hostile, we're, you know, uh, or don't use good judgment. And, you know, so we eat that half gallon of ice cream tonight to kind of calm myself down because I deserve this, you know, and we don't make the best decisions often because our prefrontal uh, cortex, which is where most judgment happens. So it's, it, it affects our brain, but it affects our cardiovascular system, makes us more likely to have all kinds of cardiovascular events. It affects our digestive system and we're, you know, having ulcers and colitis and irritable bowel syndrome and, you know, all kinds of things we don't want to have. It, it affects our immune system and we, you know, catch colds more and we don't, we have inflammation, we hurt our uh, cells and, you know, it, our, our inflammation, our, you know, white blood cells don't work the way that they usually work. So, Basically, physical health is affected in pretty much every system in the body. And then mental health is affected because we ruminate. And rumination is like the universal bad boy of mental health. It's implicated in anger disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, PTSD, psychosomatic disorders. You know, rumination is, is like, you know... If we can afford to not ruminate, let's don't ruminate. We can't always control it, but uh, but that's it's it's uh, going to affect our mental health. It's going to affect our ability to flourish. So it's not just that we will have symptoms of mental health, but somehow we just don't pursue our objectives as much and our achievements and our you know, you know, we're not able to enjoy pleasure as much, and so. And our mood gets uh, more negative. So it affects physical health, it affects mental health, it affects relationships, uh, clearly uh, affects relationships if we've had this breach with someone, especially someone important in our life. Um, and it affects our spiritual life too, because you know, for Christians, we know we should forgive. You know, Jesus says to forgive and uh, and so if we're unable to do that, we, we realize we're unable to do that. And that is uh, frustrating because we feel like that we're in some way going to be condemned for that. We're not going to be condemned because that's not what Jesus meant when he said that, you know, we're to forgive. But that act that of holding on to that negativity, that act will be condemned. That act will be something burned up like a, a straw or hay or stubble. So, <clears throat> so anyway, we, we have, you started out saying, what happens if we don't forgive? 
lots of bad stuff. It's better to forgive if we can, uh, you know, and, and we experience more good stuff then, more flourishing, more positive mental health, more, uh, you know, robustness and hardiness in our in our body, sharper thinking, better sleep, you know, things that uh, are negatively affected if we hold on to grudges. Do you think, Dr. Worthington, that a person who has no faith could truly be able to forgive? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, uh, the first book I wrote on forgiveness was with Mike McCullough and Steve Sandage that I mentioned earlier. And then the name of that book is To Forgive is Human. It's not Christian, it's human. Uh, it's like thinking. I mean, can a person who's not a Christian think? Yeah. Can they make judgments? Can they, you know, exert self-control? Yeah, they can do that because that's part of being created in the image of God. That's that's what we do because we have the image of God, whether we are Christian in our beliefs, values, and, and activities, and you know, or not. So yeah, you know, a person who's not Christian can uh, can forgive. They often don't choose to do that as much as Christians. And there's plenty of evidence that shows that all religions value forgiveness, and when a community values forgiveness and that's built into their you know, value system and practices and worship practices, then people in that environment are going to practice that more. And so so there is a difference between Christians and other religions because forgiveness is one of the two cardinal virtues in Christianity, love and forgiveness. You know, and other religions value forgiveness but they often see it differently and uh you know it's not central it's something that good people do or it's you know something that you do if the other person meets certain conditions or you know whatever so but still it's valued and practiced in the community and so people who are you know have that faith perspective do it more than people who disavow any kind of faith perspective. And Dr. Worthington, were you able to forgive yourself after the suicide of your brother? I, I uh, was able to do that. It actually took me probably, I probably struggled with that for about a year uh, before I felt like I had fully forgiven myself. I very quickly had taken it to God, uh, you know, but the stumbling block for me was to figure out, so how do you repair the social damage you did? And, uh, you know, I mean, Mike had died. I couldn't rectify that with with Mike. And it, it burned out. the The turning point happened probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight months afterwards. I was visiting his widow with my wife, and uh, and she said, "You know, Mike wrote a suicide note to you. He didn't write it to me or or to his son. He wrote it to you." And I thought, "Oh shoot." not sure I want to read this, you know, and uh, she says the uh, police have it out at Oak Ridge where Mike worked. And so I courageously drove out to Oak Ridge to get this note. No, I did not. I said, well, I've got to run some errands, but Kirby, my wife, would you mind going out and picking up that note? And so, you know, this is my fierce courage in action right here. Uh, at any rate, uh, she went out with Charlene and and uh, picked up the note. And when I read it, uh, the note said, you know, I've, um, if I, I know you'll keep your head in this uh, crisis. And she, he said, I, 
have left our finances in really disarray. And, uh, and I, you know, would you take care of our straightening out our finances? And so suddenly, you know, repairing the social damage, I, I had a way to do that. And that was kind of the stumbling block that I never could get past until, until then.